Today I'm going to talk to you about polymerase chain reaction, which we abbreviate PCR. So for the rest of this conversation, I'll be using the term PCR. And the purpose of PCR is to make lots and lots and lots and lots of copies of a piece of DNA. So we can imagine that I have a double-stranded molecule of DNA that has a particular sequence. So that's one strand of the DNA molecule from the 5' prime end to the 3' prime end, and we can write in the opposite strand. So here's a piece of chromosome, and I want to get lots and lots and lots and lots of copies of this chromosome for doing some sort of a genetic analysis, some of which we'll talk about later in the class. And initially, these two strands of DNA are base paired with each other by hydrogen bonding. One thing that we need to do to make lots of copies of this particular segment of a chromosome is to create what are called nucleotide primers. And I'm going to use pink to represent the primers. And what a primer is, it's a short, single-stranded molecule of DNA. For example, we could use the sequence ACAT for one. So a short, say, four nucleotide. Usually they're about 20 nucleotides long. So we can have ACAT as one, and we can have, say, TAT as another. And actually, for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to get rid of one of these letters. So we're going to make these three nucleotide primers. So one says cat and one says tat. And these are also written from the 5 prime to 3 prime ends. And what these primers do the critical part about PCR is that these primers are going to tell the enzyme DNA polymerase where to start copying these two strands of DNA. The only other thing that I need to mention at this point about the primers is that they need to be relatively unique sequences, which means that they're usually longer than three nucleotides. Often they're 20 nucleotides long. And the reason for that is because what's going to happen is that these short, single-stranded molecules of DNA are going to base pair with these larger or template molecules of DNA. So we refer to these as template strands or molecules of DNA. And here are the two primers. So there are three main steps to performing a PCR reaction. The first one is to denature or to melt the double-stranded DNA template molecule. The second step is to anneal the primers or to allow the primers to base pair hydrogen bond with the DNA template strands. And then the third step is called extension, which is the step where these two short DNA primers are extended. That is, the DNA is synthesized off of the three prime end. And that's when DNA replication and synthesis actually occurs. So in the first step, I mentioned that normally this double-stranded molecule of DNA would be hydrogen bonded to itself. So when we denature that molecule, those two strands become single-stranded molecules with, of course, the same sequence. with known polarity, anti-parallel. So that's the denature step. This arrow represents denaturing. How do we denature DNA? We heat it up. So the first step is to take double-stranded DNA molecules, heat them until their hydrogen bonds break and the two strands separate. That denatures those template strands of DNA. And these are template strands because they're going to provide the substrate for making an extra copy of each of those two complementary strands. And here's how. So we have a primer whose sequence 5 prime to 3 prime is CAT. 
And you'll see that here. This molecule then can base pair with this template molecule. So we have a primer now, at the next step, annealing. We mix the primers in with the DNA template strands that have been melted. We cool that solution back down so the hydrogen bonds are able to form again. This time, hydrogen bonds form between the primers and the single-stranded template molecules to form short little pieces of double-stranded DNA. So we should make sure to write in the polarity again. So that's 5 prime end to 3 prime. So we still have anti-parallel double-stranded DNA molecules. And the same is true for this primer. Which strand and where does TAT hybridize up here to the denatured DNA molecules? Well, we, we need to look for the complement ATA, which is right here. So we have TAT from 5 prime to 3 prime. So after the denaturation step, we melt the DNA. Anneal, we add the primers and let the solution cool back down to form these small little double-stranded molecules. Then what happens is we add the enzyme DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase is a protein, an enzyme. I'll just abbreviate as Paul for polymerase. And what DNA polymerase, the enzyme, does is it recognizes double-stranded molecules of DNA where there's a free 3' prime nucleotide. And it binds there, as I've drawn. And then it starts moving along the single-stranded template molecule towards the 5' prime end of that molecule. And it starts adding in the complementary nucleotides. So as polymerase on this bottom strand here moves towards the 5' prime end of the template strand, it will add in a newly synthesized G, the complement to the template, C, and so forth. And when it reaches the end of the molecule, it has no more template to copy or to base pair with, so the RNA polymerase molecule just slides right off the end of the molecule of DNA, and synthesis is completed. And the same thing will happen up here. And then DNA replication of those two template strands is complete, starting with the DNA primer and proceeding for a determined amount of time. And we'll talk later in class, probably, about what different aspects of the polymerase chain reaction of PCR experiment dictate how much DNA gets synthesized at this step. Now, one of the things you might have noticed about this initial round of PCR, and there are multiple rounds in any given PCR experiment, this was round one, denature, anneal, and extend. And then normally, we want to make more copies of DNA than just one, two new ones. We want to make thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, actually billions of extra copies of this initial, initial double-stranded DNA molecule. And so often this cycles, that's polymerase chain reaction occurs maybe 30 times. Denature, anneal, extend, denature, anneal, extend. Something that you might have noticed from this first round is that there's a nucleotide here. This th three prime thymine wasn't replicated because of the position of our primer, the CAT base paired with the GTA. So this nucleotide, this one nucleotide, hasn't been copied. And the same is true for this C up here on the complementary strand. So the point that I'm making here is that the positions of the primers, the CAT and the TAT, we define as scientists. So we say we want to make a, a copy of a specific section of the molecule. And when I designed these DNA primers, I specifically wanted to exclude copying that part and all of the nucleotides in this direction of this chromosome and the same on the other side. So right now we're only going to be making a copy of this section of the DNA. So 10 nucleotides is what we're going to be making copies of. And what I'd like to do now is to give you a little bit of a bigger picture about how this works. So in the first cycle, we started with one double-stranded DNA molecule. We have two pieces of DNA. And 
That was cycle one at the start. After that, we currently, over here, have four strands of DNA. We have those two initial template molecules. And then we have the positions of the primers, which were annealing one nucleotide in. So they weren't perfectly flush on this edge, and they also weren't perfectly flush on that edge. So there were some primers, and then they caused the synthesis of new DNA up to the ends of the chromosomes, like so. So first cycle, we had two molecules of DNA. After the first cycle, we had four. So what's going to happen after we use these four molecules in the second round of PCR? Well, long story short, we're going to wind up with eight molecules of DNA. So every round, we double the number of strands of DNA in this reaction. So after this first round of synthesis, we're going to have four template molecules. look like this. So this one is that second strand that was not completely synthesized because the primer annealed not entirely at the end of the chromosome, but extended the product all the way down to the three prime end of the template. And then we have the third strand and the fourth strand is the again one of the original double stranded molecules of DNA. So primers will anneal here in the same way that they did before. There will be a primer that will anneal to the top strand, as was shown over here. And there will be a primer that will anneal to the bottom strand, as shown here. And again, those are the primers that created those initial copies, these middle two template molecules. So these two template molecules will now have primers anneal to them here and there. This is where the magic of PCR happens. As DNA polymerase binds to the free three prime ends and extends these molecules down to the five prime end of the template strand, look what happens here. Synthesis stops, again, as I explained earlier, when polymerase reaches the end of the template. But notice that the end of the template is not the full length of the chromosome, which could extend on and on but rather stops where the original primer position, the five prime end of the primer was. And the same happens on this primer initiated synthesis of one of the new template strands. The original template strands still have synthesis continue to the end of the chromosome. The critical thing that's happened here is that we've now synthesized two strands of DNA here and here that are defined by the lengths and the positions of the primers that we're using. So when we proceed in multiple future rounds of PCR, we'll always have, so the next round we'll have 16 molecules of DNA and then 32 and then 64 and 128. Every cycle, we double the number of PCR products or amplicons, amplified pieces of DNA. And in every subsequent cycle, we get more and more of these molecules that are the short length that are defined on each end by the positions where the primers existed. And relative to them, we have fewer and fewer molecules of DNA that are the original full length chromosomes. So what we do after, again, 30 or so rounds of PCR is generate literally over a billion molecules of DNA, almost all of which are a uniform length. And the length, again, is defined by the position of the primers that we have defined. Again, we chose which primer sequences to use to initiate this experiment. So we know, we have an anticipation, we know how long this PCR product should be. So there are a couple of ways that scientists, actually there are many ways that scientists use PCR in everyday genetics. One of them is to detect very minute samples of DNA from samples, maybe forensic samples, or from environmental samples. Another one is to make lots and lots and lots and lots of copies of DNA for us to do molecular work in the laboratory. Those might include recombinant DNA te techniques like cloning, or to be able to actually determine the sequence of nucleotides on a chromosome. DNA sequencing often starts with PCR amplification, making lots of copies of the part of the chromosome that we want to sequence. 
In this section, I just want to explain to you the actual details of the PCR process. The first thing that we need to know is what are the components of putting together a PCR polymerase chain reaction? I'll probably say, say PCR reaction a lot, but you'll understand that that's redundant because the R in PCR already stands for reaction. We've already talked about two of the components of a PCR. The template is the DNA sample that we want to make lots of copies of. There will be two nucleotide primers, which are often referred to as a forward primer and a reverse primer, but they're complementary. They base pair, as you've just seen, with different strands of the initial template DNA, and they synthesize in opposite directions. We've also talked about the fact that you need a DNA polymerase. These are often enzymes that are extracted from bacteria. So in, in normal situations, we use a DNA polymerase that's from a bacterium called Thermus aquaticus, abbreviated TAC for short. And there's a special reason that we use the DNA polymerase from this organism. It's thermophilic. It's a bacterium that lives in hot springs and its DNA polymerase enzyme is naturally accustomed to working at really hot temperatures, which you'll see in a second is important for working in a PCR reaction. So template molecules, primers, DNA polymerase, the actual enzyme that does the DNA synthesis. And the only other really critical part of a PCR is that we need the building blocks to create the new DNA molecule. And those are deoxynucleotide triphosphates, or DNTPs, that is, the A's, G's, T's, and C's, the DNA polymerase will add on to the ends of the primers as it's synthesizing new DNA. And this is how this PCR reaction works. You can pool all of these items together into, say, a microfuge tube. So you add all four of those components, plus a few other things, usually a buffer to make the chemi chemical environment for the Thermus aquaticus DNA polymerase amenable to DNA amplification, and often some water. The first thing we need to do to this tube now is we need to denature the template molecule. So step one, we heat up this tube to usually about 95 degrees centigrade. That's really hot. It's more than enough to melt the two strands of DNA in the template from each other. That's the denaturation step. After that, we need to cool, as I mentioned earlier, the solution down to let the primers re-anneal or base pair with those template molecules. And that annealing step takes place at a range of cooler temperatures, somewhere between 42 and 45 degrees centigrade, let's say, although it varies depending on the actual nucleotide composition of the primers themselves. And after that, we have the extension step which happens at 72 degrees centigrade, and that's only because that happens to be an optimal temperature for the TAC DNA polymerase to incorporate those deoxynucleotide triphosphates into the newly synthesized DNA molecules. One last point to make about PCR is, it used to be the case that if you wanted to make lots of copies of DNA by performing a PCR reaction, you would have three different water baths in the laboratory set at these temperatures and you would manually hold this microfuge tube and you'd put it in the 95 degree water bath for usually about 30 seconds or so, long enough to melt all the DNA molecules. And then you would cool this down for a minute or so by moving that tube into the cooler water bath and letting the components cool. And then you'd usually have that tube moved again into the 72 degree water bath and it takes TAC polymerase about one minute to synthesize a thousand nucleotides, or to add a thousand nucleotides to a synthesizing molecule of DNA. So this step, the time it takes, depends on how long a piece of DNA you're trying to synthesize is. And then you take that tube, you put it back in the 95 degree water bath, back in the 42 degree water bath, back in the 72 degree water bath 30 times which if you do the math means you're standing at the bench with three different water baths for about four hours, moving the tubes manually. Since then, in the last couple of decades at least, if not longer, PCR machines have been generated, which are basically fancy refrigerating incubators.
that precisely the control, precisely control the temperature of an aluminum block that's inside this machine. And you then program this machine to say, incubate the tubes at 95 degrees for 30 seconds, this temperature, that amount of time, this temperature, that amount of time, and then repeat that step. So it's a simple computer, but it makes life for the molecular geneticist a lot easier because we spend much less time having undergraduate students standing at the bench moving tubes manually from water bath to water bath. One final, final thing to say about PCR at this point is you may now realize that PCR can make millions, billions, trillions of copies of a template molecule, just one double-stranded piece of DNA. And for that reason, PCR is also very sensitive to contamination. That is, if I'm trying to take a DNA sample from a human, for example, and I'm trying to ask, say I'm a forensic analyst and I want to know the DNA sequence of this DNA sample that was found at a crime scene. If one of my skin cells or one of my hair cells falls into that tube while we're doing PCR, not only is that suspect or the forensic sample DNA in this tube, but now my cells with it, their DNA are in this tube as well. So we have to take a lot of precautions, which we're going to look at next, to make sure that we don't have contamination in our PCR reactions.